I'm Amy Sharma. I'm the Vice President of Science for Georgia. On behalf of Science is Us, Technology Association of Georgia, Urban League of Greater Atlanta, Partners in Change, and Literacy for All, I'd like to welcome you all to panel two, Follow the Money. A little background here, Science for Georgia is a nonprofit that works to build bridges between science and the public. We take people on a journey from passive scientists or science learners to active science advocates. And one way to do that is to present many sides of an important issue, understand evidence-based solutions, and look for levers or changers that can have big impacts. The technical sector accounts for about 60% of jobs in Georgia, and it is at a negative 3% unemployment rate, which is certainly climbing. Six out of 10 of these jobs don't actually require a bachelor's degree, but they do require proficiency in science and math. And many of these emerging jobs may require new workforce training. The education and workforce pipeline starts at birth and ends at retirement. You could even argue it ends post-retirement because grandparents are really good teachers. Along the way, people need to learn plenty of skills in order to maintain their relevancy in the workplace as these individuals need access to training and resources, not just K through 12 training and resources, but before entering kindergarten and after exiting high school. As the economy shifts, people may need to go back to school and learn new skills, all of which costs money. Georgia K through 12 students receive about 12 billion in funding, 2.3 billion comes from the federal government and the rest from state and local sources. The state funds the university system at about 2.5 billion and technical colleges at about 375 million. Uh, it also funds Head Start at 15% of needed capacity. So this panel here is gonna explore where we spend the money in the state of Georgia, where we aren't spending enough money, how these decisions get made. Um, and it really is gonna look at innovative programs and how federal, state and local funds can be utilized to achieve a common goal. This here is a part of a four part series to address multiple parts of the education and workforce pipeline. Two weeks ago, we looked in depth at literacy and coming up in July, we're gonna look at technical and community colleges and then finally at capacity building. Uh, we're not just gonna talk a lot and then do nothing. So at the end in August, we're gonna convene a round table of these wonderful individuals and discuss what we learn, understand long-term goals and recommend feasible next steps. Science for Georgia is on the hook to work to carry these recommendations forward. So to drive this conversation and to make things happen, we've specifically asked each of our panelists to end their talk with, what is the one thing I would do or change or implement if I had all the resources in the world? So if they could wave a magic wand, what would they achieve? Uh, before I kick things off, uh, I wanna remind you that you can ask questions in the chat box. We have two amazing interns, Emma and Bethany, who are curating these questions and we will ask them during discussion time. Um, that's pretty much all the housekeeping. And then this, um, any sort of resources that get mentioned, we will make sure to put on the web page at the end of this so you can have access to them. All right, we've got some amazing panelists, starting with uh, Senator Jason Anavitarte, Stephen Owens, Polly McKinney, and Mike Looney. So we're gonna kick things off with Senator Anna Vitarte, he is vice chair on the Education and Youth Committee, a member of the Science and Technology Committee, and also on several other committees in the State Senate. He has served on the Paulding County School Board, the Board of Trustees for Chattanooga Technical College, and also served on the Board of Directors for the Innovation Fund Foundation, which was started for the Governor's Office of Student Achievement to support eligible organizations. Um, in piloting and developing and implementing innovative educational programs. So I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Anna Vitarte. Hey Amy, hey everyone. Good afternoon and um, excited to be here. This is, um, I'm glad you're having these conversations, some pretty cool topics that um, quite, quite honestly are not getting, I think the attention they need um, you know, in several areas of Georgia. And I hope after this conversation today, we can have um, some further discussion on kind of where we go 
Um, I just have some brief comments and it's, it's kind of interesting. We're talking about where the money goes since um, the appropriations bill that was signed into law from the General Assembly this year goes into effect tomorrow. So, I mean, between the austerity cut uh, reductions, restoring 60% of those and some of the other investments that the General Assembly put in place this past session, um, I, I want to kind of talk about the future and kind of where we're at um, today. So be, being somebody who's a, a graduate from Georgia Tech and somebody who's, um, you know, a, a high believer in investing in STEM programs and science and technology across our state as we kind of build, the, you know, into our communities to adapt to the global economy. Um, you know, that's not just in, I think, what the perception is in, you know, more urban or uh, suburban areas, but the impacts that it's having on our ag communities and other industries across the state. And what does that mean to, to our economy to continue to be the number one economy in Georgia going forward that started under uh, Governor Nathan Deal? Um, some of the concerns or things that um, I hope we can kind of talk about and get to today is um, you know, kind of the new environment around investment into education um, that we're in today, kind of coming, coming out of COVID. Um, seeing a lot of children across the state who may, may be experienced learning loss for a variety of reasons, or the compact or, or even a more compact impact of, of COVID-19 um, on our education systems, which, you know, don't have a lot, whole lot of money. We need to invest in our teachers more in the classroom. Um, but also finding some unique ways to, I think, fund, um, you know, some preemptive strategies to help our children um, in their education climate where we're investing more money into dyslexia initiatives, we're investing more money into mental health, especially in this day and age right now with the crisis that we've seen. Um, you know, and my concern also just in terms of seeing, you know, what are we doing to address learning loss and then building out even more um, you know, hopeful initiatives to uh, grow the science and technology capacity in our schools. I, I'll give one example in Paulding County. Um, our, our school district had a couple, you know, two or three schools maybe, you know, really investing into STEM and it was growing in a small way. And when I joined the school board, one of the initiatives working with the superintendent and our school board um, was willing to lead was how do we put STEM in all of our schools, all 33 schools in Paulding County. Um, you know, to kind of catch up with the bigger counties like Cobb and others and Douglas, um, but to make sure that our kids, even at an elementary school age, are being exposed to STEM so they can make decisions on whether they want to be a scientist or an engineer or a doctor or whatever, um, you know, as, as they got older and went through the education system. So um, we, we created an initiative and it, and it was very um, difficult and it was very um, hard because it was a culture change. Um, and basically changing a lot of positions that we had here in the county into STEM teacher programs and rolling that over the next couple of years. And they're still working on this. This isn't something that's gonna happen overnight. But I think that forward leadership, um, I think at, at, you know, happening now, even though we, a lot of school districts are facing a lot of challenges, a lot of budget challenges, um, how, how, are we, how are we becoming more innovative, I think, in terms of um, creating those opportunities and, and learn, you know, and having this discussion on a broader level. I think the other thing too um, that ties into this conversation is, is, is how are we building tomorrow's workforce? I mean, I think right now we're all experiencing and seeing small businesses, large, business, large businesses um, at a very critical stage right now that they can't find workers. I, I think this is a crisis in Georgia. Um, of epic proportions. And I think, unfortunately, for the next several weeks and months, it's potentially going to grow. And I think we need to have some hard conversations at this moment, um, you know, of what are we doing to kind of make this situation better um, and the impact that it's going to have on our technical colleges um, and our K-12 schools, and even our, in some cases, our universities, um, for workers who want to come back into the economy, who want to work, that want to change careers, um, that want to skill up in maybe some ways, um, or even, you know, those that were active duty in the military that um, are looking for a new career, but need to be retooled in their school, their uh, skill sets to be productive for their families um, in different parts of the state. And I think in that perspective, we only have a couple of opportunities in our technical college system that um, creates that um, in a truly meaningful way. So how do we broaden 
um, those opportunities to, to more geographic areas in the state. And I think that's the constant challenge is, you know, how do we do more with less? And I think we have a lot of leaders who have done a great job. The legislature has done a great job. Governor Kemp has done a great job. But I think we got, we got to think more boldly and think, um, you know, how, how do we, you know, whether it's in the cyberspace, um, whether it's, um, you know, trying to create, you know, more opportunities for welders and truck drivers, whatever it is, um, I think getting, becoming more creative on what our funding mechanisms are going to look like, I think in order to support the innovation that we need going forward as a state. So um, I'll just stop there and, and when we get to kind of Q&A and have more discussion, I'll, I'll dive in. But just want to say, Amy, thank you for having me and um, before more, looking forward to talking more about kind of what are some policy initiatives, I think, to address, you know, not just the crises um, that we have in the state, but I think also too, to kind of build off a lot of the successes that many here on this call and others have kind of worked towards seeing happen um, in the public education space, um, whether it's K-12, technical college or otherwise, so. All right. We really appreciate you uh, you being here, Senator Anna Batarte. Um, I think it's great that you're talking about thinking boldly and kind of where do we go that's out of the box because that's part of the reason we pulled everyone here today is to to think about you know a lot of people tried a lot of things in the last year and a half. So we what's out there and then kind of what do we do coming out of this? Um, yeah, so I'm really and, hmm? and I'll say one thing just to that point just real quick is. One, one of the lessons learned, and I mean, I kind of had this expectation when I came into the Senate, but even after finishing a session is, I think we're, we're constantly trying, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're constantly, I don't want to say putting a bandaid on different things, or how do we slowly move the needle, but if we really want to take Georgia, um, you know, to the next level in terms of not just com competition-wise or com from a competitive standpoint economically, but I think in order to sustain at that level, um, I think we're going to have to look big picture and be more bold, I think, in terms of some of the things that we want to accomplish, especially in the space of what we're talking about today. Um, and some of it's going to take investment. And I know with investment and budgets, it's all about, you know, what are our priorities? But we got to set ourselves, we got to set up our kids, um, you know, set them up for success. And I think also with the older generation, we got to we got to figure out too how do we set themselves up for success, them up for success, um, as they become more independent and really want to drive. You know, what what are their personal goals and objectives as a family member? So, yeah, that's great. Um, uh, right, it it would be wonderful if we moved from reactive to um, proactive, right? And I think I think now a lot of people are willing to try a lot of crazy things. So it's now's the time. So. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, we look forward to hearing more during the Q&A time and then also during the, the panel um, or not during the round table much later. Um, so we're gonna shift next to Dr. Stephen Owens. He is a senior policy analyst at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute uh, where he focuses on state policies and research that affect public K-12 education in Georgia. Uh, he was also a research and data analyst at the Georgia Department of Education. He graduated from the U University of Georgia and he got a PhD with a focus in education policy. So he is Dr. Education Policy, which is amazing. Um, welcome to the panel, Stephen, and take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I've got a little presentation here um, to talk through the state budget, um, what can be done. Um, let's see how we can make good use. Oh my heavens. Um, yeah, and what we can do to make sure that the funding is spent uh, well across the state of Georgia. Um, let me open that back up one second. No. All right. So as Amy mentioned, my name is Stephen Owens and I work for the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Um, our mission is uh, we strive to be an anti-racist uh, research and advocacy organization that advances lasting solutions to expand economic opportunity and well-being for all Georgians. Um, the budget is our middle name, and uh, I grew up in a church where the pastor said, if you want to know what someone worships, you need to look at their checkbook. And being a millennial, I can only assume that a checkbook has something to do with keeping tabs 
of the finances. And so we do a lot of that uh, at GVPI and we look at the budget as a moral document to understand kind of what are, what are we valuing. Um, I wanna talk real quick about a, a basic understanding of how Georgia funds schools because this is something that's really helpful to understand when we talk about the, the $10 billion that are going to uh, public schools uh, in this fiscal year. And it helps you to see kind of like how we, uh, how we got to where we are today. Um, and so just very briefly, you start by, by taking account of all the students in your district. We do it on two different days, one in October, uh, the, the next in March. And you're not actually counting the students. You're counting on, on where they're going. What are the programs that they're a part of? So how much of their day does the six-year-old child spend in kindergarten? Um, how much of their day do they spend in a gifted class? And so you really are, you're breaking up the child's day into six segments. And you're saying like, okay, we've got this many children in this class at this time, and then this many um, in this period. And that's helpful because depending on the program, um, students are offered different funding amounts. So we pay a lot more for a child in kindergarten for the full day than a child who's in general education high school. And this is based on uh, priorities and research uh, that were um, the foundational in the early 1980s when this formula was written. So we have 19 weights for different programs. And this is remedial education. Um, this is gifted program, English uh, for speakers of other languages, CTAE, um, these are all the programs, there are 19 of them that we provide additional funding for, five different weights for uh, students with disabilities. You multiply the number of students you have in each of those programs by those weights, and then you multiply it by a base amount. And this base amount uh, generally is paying for the salaries of teachers, because that's where um, seven out of every $10 that go into public education is going. It's going to salaries and benefits for teachers and staff. And so you take that base amount, multiply it by that number, and then you start adding indirect costs. So those first three steps, those are really variable with the number of students you gain or lose. Um, but there are other costs, which you, you need to have a media center in your school. And that doesn't matter if your school has 150 kids or has 1500 kids. And so there are these kind of like larger bulk costs um, that are taken into account in the formula. Um, after you do those indirect costs, think um, nursing, super, uh, your principals, your assistant principals, media centers, then you subtract a local share. And this is pretty, you know, this is pretty uh, revolutionary for Georgia when it was first created, um, which means that if Clayton County, I grew, uh, I grew up in Clayton County, we moved to Fayette County when I was in middle school. The difference for how much Clayton County can raise in local property taxes is huge from Fayette County, the county, you know, one imaginary borderline over. And so what the state of Georgia does is they subtract the amount they believe that both counties can raise with a certain amount of local property taxes. So per student, Clayton County is going to get more from the state um, than Fayette County is. Um, and that's now pretty common nationwide as a way to make sure that we have equitable, that we have like similar types of education, no matter where you are across the state. That's just one of the levers we use uh, in Georgia. Add on top of that categorical grants, um, for instance, giving a certain amount for school buses. Uh, another thing that just like you have to make these bulk payments um, and that don't easily fit into number of students that you'll have. And then finally, you add equalization on top. This is a several hundred million dollar grant, uh, which goes to half of all school districts uh, to make up um, for the amount you can raise in local property taxes. So while in that local fair share, it only accounts for about five mils. If some of y'all are getting your, I just got my reassessment for property taxes on our house. Um, that step five includes five mills. Step seven account tries to account for all the mills you can tax on top of it, and you can tax up to 15 additional mills um, on that. Just to kind of give you an idea, when we talk about funding per student, it's really more about um, how many teachers are we paying for in any different area? What are the libraries that we're paying for? School buses? That's kind of like, you can't talk about education without talking about like the actual infrastructure that's required um, to make that happen. So that being said, where do we stand right now? Um, K-12 education makes up just under 40% of the state's budget. This is pretty common nationwide. When you go back to uh, when state constitutions were created and ratified, public education was one of the first things 
um, that state leaders recognized was left out of the federal constitution. Um, so this huge responsibility um, that states have taken up, and it's the reason that the responsibility for education is not at the federal level or at the local level, it is at the state. That is where it is written in, and in Georgia, we have it written under the constitution that the state shall provide an adequate public education for all children. Um, that percentage is, as was mentioned before, $9.6 billion that goes to the Department of Education. This represents a $383 million cut from what the Quality Basic Education Act, uh, that formula I just described, requires um, and puts us at around 35th in the nation per student funding. Um, now that $383 million cut is not uncommon in Georgia. Uh, they've been called austerity cuts, one-time reductions, but since 2003, the state of Georgia has met the minimum requirement written into the Quality Basic Education Act to fund schools twice. Uh, and that was in 2019 and 2020. Um, so we are on the second year of $383 million cut. It was looking like it was gonna be a lot larger to Senator Anna Vitarte's point, um, but the legislature was able to restore a lot of that funding so that we are in um, this nearly $400 million cut instead of the billion dollar cut, uh, which schools had started to prepare for. All told, uh, since 2003, the state of Georgia has cut over $10 billion, sorry, just under $10 billion um, from the state's education funding formula. It goes a little bit beyond that one graph as well, because there are other areas. That's, that's just the amount that's cut from the Quality Basic Education Act and those uh, direct and indirect costs. There are costs on top of that that schools have to deal with. Um, that have either been underfunded or lowered. And one of them that we spend a lot of time talking about at GBPI is student transportation. Um, the amount has changed almost not at all uh, since I graduated in 2002, while the state of Georgia has uh, taken on hundreds of thousands of additional children. It's, it's stayed around the $135, $140 million mark uh, for about the last 20, 25 years while the cost of diesel fuel, uh, healthcare, student enrollment, all these things have gone up. Um, but when you take into account like the amount we're getting, the state funding has actually decreased. Uh, the legislature was able to add $40 million in the amended budget uh, during last general assembly, which will do a ton of good for schools. Um, I, I bring this up because if your buses aren't starting, um, then you do not have as much luxury to hire reading recovery experts or to provide wraparound services or to uh, meet the needs of the mental health of your students um, if this need is glaring you in the face. Um, and so this is something that we continue to hear from uh, superintendents about that if you don't have the local property taxes to make it up, um, then you have to pull that money from somewhere else uh, in the educational journey of these children. Um, and even on top of that, we made changes in the wake of the Great Recession as a state, which lowered the amount of funding that went to uh, low wealth school districts. That's that equalization grant I was talking about. And sparsity grants, um, which is for rural, uh, low enrollment school districts. It, even when we quote unquote fully funded public education in Georgia, we never fully funded sparsity grants. And we continue to fund that at about a quarter of the amount that that formula requires. Um, that, as Amy mentioned, state funding is not the only piece of the pie. Um, there are uh, federal dollars that pay for a lot in public education. And in the wake of the pandemic and in the middle of the pandemic actually, Congress passed three very large funding acts to send money to public schools. Um, and you can see how much it's increased each time where we had $411 million that went down to public schools last spring, increased to 1.7 billion in the fall. And then this winter, um, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan with $3.8 billion. That is money that is going to your schools right now, that your local schools are making plans on how to spend this funding um, how to mitigate the harms of the pandemic. I mean, it is, I'm, I'm not going to beat around the bush. It is a huge influx of dollars, um, but we have to recall just how painful the pandemic has been. This is, going, this is money going to address students who lost grandparents, whose parents lost jobs, homeless students who fell off the map, where, te where maybe teachers and uh, local administrators 
haven't been able to get back in touch with them. Um, so the, this is a great dollar amount, but the need is still great on how to address um, the harms of the pandemic. And it's no substitute. And uh, state lawmakers on, on both sides of the aisle said the same. This is no substitute for consistent state funding, because if you start building your budget on this one time uh, federal funds, um, it'll be really hard to make that budget uh, in a few years when it's gone. And it's, so it makes it harder to kind of think through like salaries and, and how can we use this money well. One missing piece uh, that we have been pushing really hard for at GBPI is the fact that Georgia is one of eight states that does not have a weight in the funding formula specifically for students living in poverty. Um, we have a lot of great elements inside of the Quality Basic Education Act that were ahead of their time. Uh, we fund English language learners at a higher weight than literally every other part of the country. We provide additional funding for kids to take college classes while they're in high school via dual enrollment, which has been a model for the nation. Um, but this idea of a poverty weight, or we can call it an opportunity weight, there's a bill right now that's yet to get a hearing, um, HB 10, uh, which would address that, um, which would mean it, bring us into the 21st century as a way to meet that need uh, that we know that schools uh, feel every day in their students. Um, Pre-kindergarten, uh, I'm just gonna talk just a second about this. This is a based on a report I published uh, earlier this spring. Um, in uh, the wake of this great recession, the state of Georgia uh, made some cuts to pre-kindergarten and actually raised the class sizes for student uh, for each of the students per teacher and assistant teacher. And we've never made that change in the, in the 10 years of economic expansion since then. And so while funding for pre-K has recovered and kind of gotten back up uh, to where it was before the recession, uh, it would have been much higher had we not made that cuts towards uh, to make larger class sizes. And so pre-K continues to kind of be in that place. And there are other changes um, which we recognize in pre-K. We did a survey for uh, pre-K centers to find out wh where do they see the need. And they regularly talked about losing great assistant teachers because the state of Georgia only provides $16,000 a year for pre-K assistant teachers and then losing their lead teachers into the K-12 system. So definitely something to keep an eye out uh, because Georgia really showed the rest of the country what to do with our lottery funds when it came to the pre-K system. And the hope is that we can continue to protect it and invest in it so that it can be a model for the nation moving forward. Um, I can just talk very briefly about what can be done. Um, there, We are in a moment where our lawmakers uh, need to hear from us. And, and that's something that uh, policymakers have said to me as well, is that they want to know what the needs of the schools are. Um, the governor has just called together committees to find out how to use additional this pandemic relief funds. They need to hear from us about the needs in our communities. Um, and also being active in your school board decisions, making sure that as they spend these billions of dollars in federal money, that you can show, show them kind of where the needs are that you see, what are the student groups that you feel like are being left behind and how can we address them? Um, GBPI is the lead organization in a new coalition called Fund Georgia's Future. We would also love to have your feedback. We have this short five minute survey uh, that I'll put in the chat to just hear how do you experience school funding? Do you feel like your school district uses it well? Do you feel like the state provides your school district uh, enough funding. Um, and so we would love to hear uh, from y'all. And that is it for me. Amy, I don't know if you want me to give my one, oh my goodness, I'm now seeing one minute warnings four minutes ago. My apologies. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you want me to give my one wave of the wand policy change, I can do that now or I can wait. I mean, go for it. I, I think you and I talked about this on the phone. I, while I would love for it to be an education thing, the state of Georgia is uh, one of the last holdouts to not expand Medicaid. And w people in education know the impact of all the other parts of a child's life on, um, on their educational attainment. And we're talking billions of dollars would flow into the state of Georgia. Hundreds of thousands of people would get Medicaid, it pulls at 70% approval. I mean, there's just so little downside. Expanding Medicaid would easily be the, the one I would do. So 
that's it for me. I'm sorry I went over. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for all that. Um, it's cool. Uh, my interns love graphs, so they were really excited about this whole talk. So um, that's what happens when you have science interns. So uh, thank you so much for that insight into the budget and how we spend our money. Um, we're going to um, then turn it over here to Polly McKinney. She's the advocacy director for Voices for Georgia's Children. Uh, she also owns a strategic communications company. Uh, she serves on the Georgia School-Based Health Alliance Board. She's a member of the National Juvenile Justice Network and is the past chair of Childkind. Um, she spent more than two decades in various production capabilities in the Georgia film industry. And she was a member of the first class of North Carolina School of Science and Math, which I have a special place in my heart for just because I went to school down the um, road from it, which is also why I really liked her until I found out she went to UNC Chapel Hill. But we can still be friends, Polly, just not during basketball season. Um, I'm so glad you're on this panel. Please take it away and the floor is yours. Okay, well, I, I uh, Stephen covered a lot, and, and Senator Anna Vitarte covered a lot of the stuff that I had on my notes, so I've got like lots of scratch marks. So I'm just going to kind of hit some things that I didn't didn't hear, um, or that reinforce some of the stuff that they both have said. Um, and my Georgia Vo Voices for Georgia's Children is a whole child policy shop, so that means that we look at uh, child development including education in a sort of holistic way, realizing that children traverse government systems and it's not the other way around. So, you, you know, each child can touch multiple systems often at the same time. Um, and so we realize that any solutions in one sector can really affect outcomes in another sector. Um, so I'm just gonna plop that out there so that you guys kind of know where I'm coming from. What I'm just to say. Um, and, Again, the prior speakers have covered a lot of the ground that we all talk about uh, at the Capitol and in child policy. Um, but I was going to throw a few numbers out. Um, so uh, Stephen mentioned the uh, drop in enrollment in the kids that, that didn't enroll in school over last year of the COVID session. And we've got, I was just going to give you some numbers. Uh, K-12 enrollment was down about 2% uh, last year, uh, 30, about 35,000, a little over 35,000 students. And kindergarten enrollment alone was down 10%. Uh, Pre-K enrollment alone, which is not counted in the other numbers I just said, was down about 19%. So I think that when you look at, at what happened during the pandemic and what you know, we're recovering from, um, it's important to, to bear in mind how complicated it was between broadband access, which is something that, that we, have, we knew was a problem and really learned is, is a thing. <laughs> if you didn't know it before the pandemic, you certainly know it now. Um, and the state has been working really hard and they were working hard before the pandemic to up communication uh, through broadband connectivity um, and put a lot more money even in now and the federal government put a lot more money now, um, I see a thing from Becky Evans, uh, Representative Evans, it was down 19%, 19%, not 95 <laughs> and not nine. It was 19% according to the House Budget Office um, for pre-K. So, um, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there in the K-12 arena. Um, I will say that, uh, and I won't get into deep policy stuff at the moment, like bills and things, I'll wait for the Q&A for that. But um, the lottery, uh, to Stephen's point, also funds. We put, last year, we put about three hundred seventy-nine million dollars of lottery funding into pre-K, Georgia pre-K, which serves just four-year-olds, um, and that is about eighty-two thousand. It hovers between eighty and eighty-two thousand slots, and it's it's a complicated uh, conversation because a lot of those funds not only um, support. Uh, the four-year-olds, but the, the centers don't just serve four-year-olds. The early learning centers serve, you know, a lot of times infants through four. Um, and so a lot of times you end up with, uh, for their business models, the braided funding, which is why the, the head count went up back during the Great Recession, um, because the lottery was not able to maintain the, the funding in the way that we had thought. So there were a lot of compromises made and we recovered a lot of it, like increased the school days back to how many days they were, but we have not 
lowered the head count. Um, and I would say that's not all in the state. A lot of that is the owners trying to make their business models work. So it's a really, it's a kind of frustrating but complicated uh, thing that I just wanted to clarify from where we sit. Um, but last year, I will say the, the legislature put, they, they increased state dollars in, uh, increased lottery funding by 1.7 million or about two and a half percent for pre-K. And that was the first time in over a decade that the number of lottery dollars was, the ante was upped um, so that was the, I know that DECAL, the Department of Early Care and Learning was really happy to have those dollars. Um, let me, I'm just looking for this to see what hasn't already been said. Um, I won't, I hear you're going to be talking about the university system and TCSG next time, Amy, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll leave that out as well. Um, but some of this stuff that I think is really important for people to think about when we think about workforce and education are the things that don't fall under tech like the education agencies necessarily in an exact like <laughs> book learning kind of way i think that it's really important to realize that the things that build that make education possible and build workforce uh have to do with family supports so things like child care right we have a number of, of teachers and other professionals who are, have not been able to go back to work uh as teachers right whether in pre preschools or in in K-12 because they have children at home themselves through the pandemic. So I think it makes you think bigger about how childcare functions and the, the foundational block that that is to promote uh, to promote learning. Um, yeah, and, and Senator Anvitarte said uh, has uh, the CAPS funding. Yeah, the Child and Parent Services funding, which is basically childcare subsidies um, and the state the FY22 budget up to that ante. And then we also have some extra dollars coming from the feds for that. It's usually primarily federal dollars that fund childcare subsidies for qualified families. Um, so that's a big thing to keep on the radar. That's a really important piece. I would also say that about half of that CAPS funding uh, covers birth through four, birth through five. The other about half covers school age kids because after school and places for kids who are you know, five to 12 to be after school where their parents are working is really important. And we at Voices have the Georgia Statewide After School Network um, under our umbrella. Um, Katie Landis is the director of that operation and they have been super um, active in the, uh, in the after school and summer enrichment space. And that is a big, big key and will be, continue to be a big key in uh, we don't call it learning loss there. We call it learning acceleration um, because during the pandemic, everybody had learning loss, including us. <laughs> but well, but kids learned other things through that time that may not be measurable on a test per se, but were still important other skills and other learning. So we prefer to think of what we have to do ahead of us as learning acceleration or academic acceleration. Um, and there's a whole lot of uh, funding coming down the pike for that for after school. So I know that uh, last year, the, the state um, in the state budget uh, put in 4.73 million in DFACs for the after school cares program to help kids, high needs kids, or kids in high needs situations with after school. And now there are federal dollars coming down. Um, I think it's the ARP, the American Rescue Plan funding about $5 million for the Department of Early Care and Learning for a school age grants uh, targeted at after school and summer learning. And there's another 85 million coming down to the Georgia Department of Ed um, for after school and summer learning. So we're really excited that those dollars um, are going to uh, help with this learning acceleration for kids who are coming out of um, pandemic situations. Uh, let's see, there's a question here. Where will the federal dollars for funding childcare come from? Um, I believe they are from the American Rescue Plan, uh, Representative Evans, but I will look and get, get back to you while somebody else is talking and confirm that. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where some of them came from, as well as the state dollars that y'all put in um, this year. Other stuff I think is really important to be aware of in terms of money and how it should be spent, where it should be spent, adult literacy, when parents can't read, that it is less likely that the children will be as successful in reading. Um, so we need to think harder about how we uh, help more adults read. And I know, you, I think, Amy, I think you said you already covered that in your last uh, meeting. Um, 
I think that practical, uh, like we need to think about the vast population we have um, in our criminal justice system. We have a lot of youth and adults who are struggling to get integrated into the workforce um, and who need a second chance and sometimes a third chance. Um, and so we have to, we've been working on this for years since the deal administration and on into this current time, um, but looking at our policies in terms of educating and uh, helping folks re-enter society and re-enter the workforce. And I mean, youth and adults, um, because it is a, it's a, a lot of people with a lot of um, untapped potential and, you know, and they need some supports. Um, on, on many levels. Uh, behavioral health, we mentioned that already. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death, uh, not counting medical death, um, for children 10 to 17. So, and that's not counting all of the like thousands and thousands of attempted suicides. Um, so I just wanna be really clear about that. Oh, I got a one minute warning, so I'll be going really fast. So behavioral health, legislature has been great about putting money into school-based behavioral health. Uh, with the APEX program, let's keep that going and keep adding to that. Um, and if I have, I mean, there's all a million other things to talk about, but healthcare, paid family leave, uh, transportation is a huge barrier for families to get childcare and education. Um, and streamlining of systems. I'll talk really fast, but as we get into this, you'll hear me talk a lot about putting things in places where people are. So we're huge fans, as you may have guessed, for comprehensive school-based health centers in schools. So they're like clinics that are in schools that have primary care physicians and nurses who are working in the schools alongside of the school nurses. Um, and those have been incredibly successful at helping kids get educated and keeping them in school so they don't have to leave for a doctor's appointment for the whole day. It treats asthma, flu shots, uh, other immunizations, um, dental care, behavioral health, all of that. We're big fans of that. And I'm going to, I know I'm at my limit, so I'm going to stop talking about that more. So I'm eager for your questions. And with that, Amy, I'll let you go. Oh, wow. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Polly. That was great. Um, I like how you touched on it's not just what's happening in school. Um, so we're definitely going to explore that a little bit more in the question and answer time, because I think that's a, a really big part of what's happening. Um, um, so thank you for that. That was great. Um, okay. So um, Emma and Bethany are going to kill me if I don't remind the audience that if you have questions, please put them in the chat because they will be will be answering that or we'll be asking them during the Q&A time. So please put those into the chat. And then now our final speaker is Dr. Mike Looney. Uh, he is superintendent of Fulton County Schools. He has been a public educator since 1994, a classroom teacher, assistant principal. Principal. He was superintendent at Butler County School District in Alabama. And so there in Alabama, his school district realized significant student achievement gains, improved the graduation rate, and established the district's first magnet school. Most recently, he was the superintendent of Williamson County Schools in Tennessee. It's like a tour of the South. This is awesome. And he has served on several distinguished panels, including President George W. Bush's National Reading Leadership Panel. And prior, prior to entering the field of education, he served as a finance man, manager and also in the US Marine Corps. Um, he has a hidden talent for dad jokes and we are really excited that he is here today. Take it away. Well, I don't know about dad jokes. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. I thought my jokes were really, really good, Amy. I will no, say no, this. No, I said dad, not oh, bad. dad jokes. I got you. You're I will very say this. Good. Stephen made me feel very guilty. So I decided after he made the comment about look at your checkbook to see what you value. So I have determined that I value fuel, food, and friends. So I don't know what that says about me. I'm, so I'm need glad to, I need that you. The evaluation of, of my my life's priorities. So obviously in Fulton County, we're no different than in the other school district uh, coming out of this post, uh, hopefully it's a post pandemic environment to um, beginning to, to think very strategically and purposefully about how we're going to help our students recover from the learning disruption. And I emphasize learning disruption because, um, you know, there's been a lot of chatter uh, out in, in the education arena and the 
political arena that there's been a lot of learning loss. I would submit to you, good ladies and gentlemen, that our students have been learning some really important and sometimes painful life lessons. So it's not that they haven't been learning, they haven't been losing learning. Uh, they, their learning was disrupted and they've been learning about things other than you know, how to multiply two numbers together albeit that they have continued to do that. They just haven't done it at the same rate that they otherwise uh, would have been expected to had the pandemic not occur. And so in, in Fulton County, um, we are at a crossroads. We have drawn a line in the sand, not only as a result of uh, the pandemic, but certainly uh, that has been an influential factor. But looking at our internal data in Fulton County for the last several decades, we as most districts in the country have been unable to uh, turn the page and get all of our students reading on grade level. And whether we're talking about science, mathematics, social studies, the arts, um, any content area, the reality of it is that our students have to be able to read competently um, in order to uh, understand and survive in the world uh, in which we live. And that certainly includes the workforce. So we have a multi-pronged strategy and I'll start by talking about the high school just for a moment. At the high school level, um, Georgia actually has um, a really cool, unique uh, diploma option that's called Dual Enrollment Diploma Option D. Not a lot of people know about Diploma Option D, but um, I've been here two years and I learned about it. And so we're kind of rethinking, uh, you know, how do we get students to walk across the stage and not continue to, to tell the, 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 the false narrative that every student to be successful in life has to go to a four-year college and become a physician, a doctor, um, or a lawyer. Um, that's simply not true. If you look at where the job growth is today, a lot of uh, great career fields don't require a four-year degree. They do require uh, the ability to think, uh, you know, uh, about complex things, work with other people, and have, uh, you know, those soft skill sets. So we're, we are looking at dual, dual enrollment diploma option B in, a, in, a, in addition to diploma option A. Diploma option A dual enrollment is where kids uh, come to school, they go to college part of the time, and they walk away with some college credits and also some high school credits. And in some cases, they walk away with a two-year degree. And we have a lot of students that are already participating in that. But what we haven't done a good job on, uh, of is, is helping students find a career technical education pathway that leads both to a high school diploma, but also to a CTAE, a career technical agricultural educational certification that leads directly to a job, whether it's a job in the military or whether it's a job for a plumbing or electrical company, uh, there are really, really good high paying jobs out there in some cases that make more than a superintendent with, with a high school degree and some certifications. So we're focusing on that at the high school level. And I'm excited about the board's work uh, and leaning in, making sure that students have options when they walk away from high school, that they can either go to a four year institution, they can go to the world of work or continue a CTA or a career tech pathway at a two year institution or join the military and serve their country in some honorable way. So uh, we're focusing on that at, uh, at the high school level. We have two um, brand new schools that will be opening up this fall, the Global Impact Academy uh, in, in South Fulton and the uh, Innovation Academy in North Fulton. Both are STEM campuses with the latest and greatest state-of-the-art technology. Uh, and our teachers, our board allowed us to hire those teachers that were gonna be working in those two high schools. Um, a year early to begin training them and building a curriculum around STEM that was relevant to students. One of the challenges that we face in schools these days is in making learning relevant to the students that we serve. It's one thing to learn in the textbook, but it's a whole nother thing to, to see how that, what you're learning in the textbook actually applies to real life, the world of work, et cetera. And so we're, we're focusing on that. And we've been working with uh, two sets of teachers from most different schools for a whole year now, building out a curriculum that has internships, externships, uh, people coming in and doing seminars, kind of like TED Talks, um, where students are working on real life projects from, from the business world, solving those problems that businesses have uh, in a meaningful way. And so that's what we're doing at the high school level. At the middle school level, um, I truly believe that we've for decades now been kind of short shifting our, our middle school students. Um, and so we're reinventing the middle school concept here in Fulton County Schools by lowering career technical education 
classes all the way down to sixth grade. So this past year was, even though we were in uh, remote learning for a bulk, the bulk of our students, we offered every student a sixth grade career technical education course, an exploratory course, where they um, are exposed to all the different career technical education pathways uh, that the state of Georgia allows. We aligned that coursework with an assessment that the state of Georgia pays for called U Science. And U Science is, is an aptitude uh, uh, inventory about, you know, are you naturally, uh, you know, uh, gifted or, or do you have natural abilities in, in mechanical kinds of things or do you have natural abilities in writing? And, and these are the career fields that line up to your natural talents and abilities. So students take that assessment. Uh, we talk to them about that assessment and their results. And then they get to explore their career, the different career fields that are available to them all the way down to the middle school level so that in the seventh and eighth grade, they can actually formally begin a career technical ed education pathway and build a bridge to the ninth grade. And by the ninth grade, if a student stays in the same pathway, it's perfectly possible in Fulton County now for a ninth grader to enter ninth grade and only have one additional CTA course to, to, to take in order to be a pathway completer. And the research is really prolific and, 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 and just profound that students that complete a career technical pathway have a higher, gradu higher graduation rate and a higher success rate in, in post high school environment. So we're leaning in in our middle schools um, to do that. We are also um, kind of upsetting the apple cart by exploring the development of K-8 schools, moving away from putting 1,000 or 1,500 student middle school students that are all going through puberty at the same time um, and, and going back to a K-8 model where you have fewer middle school students uh, mixed with obviously students in grades K through 8. The benefit of that is you have smaller numbers of students going through puberty at the same time. And if you've ever been around a middle school student or a teenager, you know that they temporarily uh, kind of lose their wits and their footing and it takes them a while to come back to, to, to normal. And so um, we believe that smaller numbers of those students would allow us to support them in a more personalized way. Uh, they also get to remain a, a child a little bit longer and not exposed to some of the, the other things that their peers might be engaged in. They get to act as a role model and serve as a role model to the younger students and the younger students have something to look up to in their older peers. So we're exploring that. And then um, at the elementary school level, um, once again, we have recognized that for too long, the country schools, um, the region schools, and even Georgia schools have not done a good enough job of teaching students to read on grade level early enough. And so we know that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's our line in the sand that we are 100% committed to doing something different so that all of our students can read with success by the end of third grade. And so we are training all of our teachers and administrators in the science of reading. Uh, believe it or not, there is actually science behind what how students learn to read. Uh, the problem has been is that for too long, um, schools, including post-secondary institutions, have ignored the science and relied on tradition and, you know, what what's popular amongst teachers and authors and that sort of thing. So we're going to be spending two years uh, training all of our teachers in the and leaders in the science of reading starting this, actually next month. Our, our school administrator is going to start next month. And we're investing about $90 million of our federal funds that we're receiving as a result of, of COVID-19 in the effort to train our teachers, to retrain our teachers, and using the science re of reading to ensure that our students get to grade level on time and can read and comprehend the material. Um, that sounds very straightforward. Obviously, it's a lot more complex than that. There's a lot of change management that has to happen. There's, there's a lot of you know, taking away resources that haven't proven to be effective over the years and replacing those with science-based uh, teaching of, of reading resources uh, and that sort of thing. And of course, that includes retraining our paraprofessionals, doing parent universities, getting our parents acclimated to the work that we're doing, um, and, and the broader public, including the volunteers that we're blessed to have in our schools. Each day in our school district, we have thousands of people that come and volunteer with students. But if they're not doing uh, the things that show it leads to, to good outcomes, then we're doing a disservice to our students and also a disservice to 
the precious time that those volunteers are giving us. And so the truth of it is, is we know that in order to create transformational change in Fulton County, we have to lean in uh, to, our, to our teachers and to our leaders, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that get the work done. Nobody at the central office, no superintendent, no school board member can do that work. We have to rely on the teachers and the leaders of those schools. And in order for them to be successful, we have to equip them with the latest and greatest information that we have and the tools that we have based on the science of reading. And um, so that's what we're doing in Fulton County Schools. I will say um, this next two years is going to be exciting. It's going to be a, a, a little bit treacherous because change is hard. But we know in order for students to be successful, they have to be able to read on grade level. And so I want to just close with this. Being able to read on grade level is obviously the main goal, but you can read third grade words and not know what those third grade words mean. And so along with the science of reading, we're focused on two other strategies. One is a student of poverty that enters kindergarten for the first time. When compared to a student of affluence, a family of affluence, um, when you look at their vocabulary, the number of words they know and use on an everyday basis, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of word variation between the students that have had a poor background or an economically disadvantaged background versus an affluent background. And the, the amount of words that you know has a direct impact on your ability to comprehend uh, context or content. And so we're focusing on building robust vocabulary for all of our students, but particularly our students that come in from impoverished or disadvantaged backgrounds. And then finally, the third strategy is, um, I used to tell, when I was a principal, I used to tell my teachers this all the time because I, I was a principal of Title I school. And, you know, we would be reading and let's just say the word escalator was in a text that the students had to read. Well, if a student reads the word escalator, we can certainly teach them to decode the word escalator. But if they've never seen one, if they've never ridden on one, if they've, if they've never had any experience about an escalator, then it's really hard for them to comprehend the word escalator. It's just a word on paper, and it kind of reinforces the notion that reading doesn't make sense. So we're leaning in to field trips, to building background experiences for our students that don't have the privilege of traveling to Europe uh, during the, the winter or summer holiday, that, that don't have, uh, their families don't have a second home on the beach, and they've never smelt the salt water or or the, 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 the sand in, you know, between their feet and the seagulls flying over. You have to have background experiences to understand the world around you. And it's then when we can, we can mix learning to read with learning history, with learning civics, and with learning science. And so um, I agree with uh, what the representative said. We've had this, uh, this you know, focus and fix and patch um, know, mentality and public education for a lot of years. And I think now is the time we've been given uh, a blessing with these additional resources to do something transformational that we had never been able to do before. And that's what we're going to do in Fulton County. Awesome. Um, I expected more dad jokes, but... Um, I was intimidated by you. You called me out, so I was a little bit intimidated by it. Oh, I'm sorry. I like put you on the spot. You're really nervous. Um, anyways, but I do... Um, on a serious note, we here at Science for Georgia are so excited that you said the science of reading like a thousand times because it's absolutely great that you guys are using science and evidence to then turn around and teach children. So that makes us very happy. Um, um, thank you so much for that. So at this time, I'm going to ask all our panels panelists to to come back into the Hollywood squares here so we can we can have some q and A. I'll I'll take Emmy for 10. <laughs> See, you did it. All right, um, so that's great. I'm so glad for this. Um, so then my first question, and you know, we're gonna uh, kick this off to Mike, um, is that, you know, you have made a decision to spend $90 million and just like kick the apple cart over and be like, we've been doing it wrong and let's do it right now um, in terms of teaching reading. Um, and you said change management, which I think is a really big deal. So I'm starting this off with you, Mike, like what barriers do you think you're going to have to overcome and how are you going to do change management? And then I welcome our other panelists to chime in about like, 
what barriers they see to trying to do something new? Well, I, you know, the truth is, I don't know what I don't know. Um, so I, I don't know that I can answer it fully. What I do know is oftentimes we adults are the ones that get in the way of progress. Um, our kids are always resilient. Our kids are always able to adapt, but it's we adults that struggle with that. And so I think it's about being transparent um, and true with our customers, which includes our parents, our, our, our community, and quite frankly, our employees. And it's not that they've been doing it wrong because we have had success. We just haven't had success with all of our students. And, and I, I know, I know as a professional, I know as a dad, I know as a human being that, that we can get twice as many students reading on grade level if we just focus on what works and take away the bad habits that we've allowed ourselves to become ingrained with. And so I think it's about transparency. I think it's about truthfulness. And quite frankly, I, I, think it's a, I think it's about willing to take risk and, and having grit enough uh, from a political frontier, from a parent frontier. You know, every, every mom and dad thinks their child is gifted and everyone expects their child to come home with all eights. Um, and every kindergarten parent thinks that their child is already ahead of learning phonics, but that's just simply not true. And so we, we have to be willing to have those honest conversations with all of our stakeholders and quite frankly, I'm glad that we have a, a legislature on today. I, I think it's going to take some political proudness uh, uh, to, to make sure that um, the state continues to allow school districts uh, to meet the needs of their students with uh, minimal uh, interference or interruption. And I know Georgia prides itself on that. Yeah, do you mind if I uh, jump in there as well? I, I agree with everything Mike said, and I appreciate him talking about um, just what it looks like to have the two educational systems. I, I was listening to a talk once and the speaker mentioned that if you take the top 15% of students from every country, the United States has far and away the best educational system, public educational system in the world. It's how we treat our low income students and it's how we serve those kids that, um, uh, that have unique needs, that need to learn English, uh, that uh, have disabilities, that, um, once we address um, those students who are struggling, uh, the, the promise for our country, I mean, we just have so much room to grow in that area. Um, and then just as far as uh, what it looks like for barriers, I appreciated uh, the superintendents talking about like, what does it look like to work with communities, with our teachers? I really appreciated the, the thousand dollar stipend that the governor and uh, state superintendent worked to provide for all teachers and school staff. I mean, that's really equitable. I guess to school bus drivers who might be making pennies on the dollar compared to their, their teacher um, co-workers. And so I think kind of recognizing what was the impact of this pandemic on our, our supers, our school board members, our staff, teachers, uh, we're just going to be dealing with this for a long time. And if, and if we don't have those difficult conversations, we'll lose out on, on some of the good things that can come um, from reimagining education in the, after the pandemic. Stephen, I can't help but chime in one more time because you, you, you tug at something in my heartstrings. So I will tell you, of course, I have yet to meet a teacher that says they don't deserve more pay, and I would agree with them. They do. Uh, but I will tell you, even myself as an educator, I didn't get into teaching um, to, for the pay. Obviously, I had to feed, feed my family. I had, had to feed my family at the time. What's happening now, why people are leaving the profession of teaching, it's not about compensation. It's really about the attack on public ed. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it is a very, very difficult time to be in public education, uh, you know, from fights about content, about, you know, a, 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 you know, that really doesn't... It, What's happening is the politics of our country is, is taking center stage in our classrooms. Our teachers are caught in the middle um, and, and there's no win here. And so I, I think that part of the solution is really um, you know, figuring out how to support teachers once again in the classroom because they're, they're, they are, they're tired, they're frustrated, and they feel very uh, beat up and abused. I would love to throw in a couple of words too, because I think one of the things that uh, that we talk about peripherally in education um, are the kids. And I think that there is a lot of room um, for supporting the kids because the, the, having the right workforce and the right teachers and the right mental health support and all of those things are really important. But the wraparound services are really important too. Like, you know, you can't learn, doesn't matter how good the teacher is, if you're hungry or you're scared or you've experienced trauma, there is no way that you can learn to read it at the level that you are 
probably capable of without those barriers. And so I think that as we think about um, education and workforce, there's, there's a trajectory that moves um, beyond the books and the, even the learning disabilities. And I've often thought that, you know, we have designed historically systems of all kinds for uh, people who probably can already be successful, right? The, the kids who have two parents uh, who have enough resource, who don't come to school hungry, who are not afraid of their neighborhoods, who, you know, don't have a, a, a developmental disability or learning disability. You know, we've designed our systems to reward uh, those children that that have fewer of those, uh, I mean, some of them are technically adverse childhood experiences, but but many of them are just adverse childhood experiences without being falling under that umbrella um, or adverse life experiences. And so I would love for us to think not so much about making those children who have those barriers, not thinking about them as the abnormal children or of the less than children or of the children who have a special something or other, but thinking of that, that is those Barriers are more normal than not having barriers. And so I think as we look at our funding streams and how we approach learning, it's much more, you know, historically it has not been like Superintendent Looney's approach, you know, looking at how can we serve, how can we make this truly child centric and family centric uh, in terms of what we develop our human beings to become. And I know that sounds like really high flying and philosophical, but when you look at dollars and you look at, at, at thought programs, you know, we need to think that the exception is the rule and design our funding streams around making the exception the rule instead of the other way around. So that's just my big like nine billion. Yeah, but you know. and I'll say, Polly, I don't, I don't think that's highly philosophical because I think, I mean, I, I work for an organization and I know there's others around the state that, um, yeah, I, I think that's what we're working towards is, you know, how do, how do you take blended funding m models to basically achieve a lot of this stuff and and you know we we don't i don't want to get into a whole debate over expand medicaid or not expand medicaid but at the end of the day if you don't address housing you don't address food you don't address mental health you don't address transportation and broadband access and, and when i say broadband access i mean not just like in my district where the most western part of my district that's ag that touches alabama that's not so suburban where there is no internet but broadband access where, because schools were closed in inner city Atlanta for an entire year and wireless devices were used because they were close to McDonald's or they were close to these other facilities. And I just recently had this conversation with the leadership at Atlanta Technical College. Um, you know, th there's that piece, which we all recognize that, but I don't think the greater populace in terms of leaders across our state, whether you're Republican or Democrat, or having that conversation about what does that impact to K-12, technical college, but also too, if I'm wanting to start a business and I'm this close, but just because I can't get on my blasted device, like it's holding me back. And I think, um, again, when I, you know, going not to beat a dead horse, but you know, the whole bold or I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it, about the whole risk, risk taking thing is I think we have so many politicians and I'm one that I keep telling my constituents and everyone, and I'll say it publicly that, you know, I have nothing to lose. So if you're, you know, these politicians that, you know, don't want to take some sort of risk because you're afraid to fail, we're not going to solve these problems. And I think we got to, we got to get to that point where, you know, whether we agree or disagree, um, if a child is not, is if a child is homeless, and I have, I've seen and experienced homeless kids in Paulding County, Georgia, um, who, you know, are struggling just to get the basic education because of that dynamic, or they're not eating every day, then the rest of this conversation is meaningless. Um, so I think, I think we gotta, you know, I figure out, you know, how do we do more than one thing at one time, but at the same time, also, how do we make it sustainable, you know, for the next two decades and beyond, you know, because we're, we're you know, this is a generational discussion. I think COVID, um, is, a, is a generational moment in time that, you know, my kids, you know, their grandkids, you know, there's going to be takeaways that are going to impact them for the next many decades to come. Um, but, but I think we, we got to figure out, you know, how do you build the wrap services? And I, I agree. I mean, it, it takes, you know, you know, addressing the funding issue, but if we don't look to a more blended um, way to fund projects like we do in transportation, then, 
I mean, I think, you know, this is going to be a very difficult, um, you know, next few years um, if we don't think more outside the box and I think come up with some more innovative ideas. So, um, you know, and I, and I think that that's goes for the entire spectrum, whether you're conservative or liberal or whatever your philosophical belief is, um, you know, we got, we got to think differently. And I, and I think the other part to you, and I know I'm taking up everyone's time, but I think, you know, even, even to your point, Mike, where I know we're working on trying to build multiple pathways, um, you know, in, in the K-12 space. But I think this, this, whole, this whole discussion also about, you know, what are we doing for our teachers, but how are we recruiting new teachers? How are we, uh, you know, creating models to retain teachers after five years? Um, you know, this whole discussion, which is kind of being, it's kind of set aside while we're working on all this stuff. But if you don't have the workforce, especially now, I mean, again, what are we doing? So, um, so I look forward to just having more just conversation and coming up with maybe some action items on how do we do some of this stuff. Okay, um, this was awesome and also great because it's going to make me look like you guys were fed these questions ahead of time. Because uh, the second we have two questions to follow on from the audience that really make a lot of sense in light of what you said. So the first one, um, we'll start with Polly, but the rest of you can definitely join in. Uh, everybody's been talking about wraparound services. And this is exactly like um, how, like, I think we should, a lot of us would say, well, in an ideal world, the school shouldn't have to feed the kids and it shouldn't have to make sure that they've gotten their vaccines and their vitamins and all of those things. But that is the reality that we live in. And that is also like, that's where the kids are. So let's go to them. So then how how do we just accept this as our reality and then make schools centers, if this makes sense, make school centers not only for learning, but as Polly said, centers for aspects of student well being or having a, a full time doctor there to address medical needs or things like that. How do we do that? So, so I would say there are a few ways, right? So there's never just one way. <laughs> that would be too easy. Um, but I would say, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think comprehensive school-based health centers, we tend to, the ones that are attached to a federally qualified health center, another large health body uh, are extra successful because you can refer out, you can serve whole families, you can serve the teaching population uh, and reduce teacher absenteeism. You can make it easier for people to do their work. I mean, and for kids to go to school. Um, I think if we all start thinking, if you start thinking about asking children if you ask children a question, and I'm sure we can all test this, they will tell you, they really will tell you what you need, what they need if you are open to hear it. And if you allow them the space, and if you understand that their communication is not necessarily just verbal, it's other things. But when you start looking at, at communication, what people need, you know, ask them, what would, make, what would make it easier for you to go to work? Well, you know, sometimes it's pay, sometimes it is childcare, sometimes it is a pleasant working environment. Sometimes it is knowing that you are not um, having to be dishonest about why you need time off. Um, some of it is bringing the services to you, um, and which is why we like school-based health centers. Um, and some of it is stuff that's like laundry facilities. You know, shame is a barrier to learning. Um, and if you're at a home where your family is maxed out, you have an ill family member that everybody has to focus on and give care to. You have other traumas, um, a car that doesn't work, a refrigerator that doesn't work. You have, um, you know, a, a, a family member who has mental illness or has a behavioral health problem or addiction, and you're still expected to show up and learn, or you're still expected to show up and teach. How do we help those people? How do we help those human beings with what we can help them with? How do we make things less complicated? Um, and some of that the government can do with systems like making data systems talk to each other, huge problem that our data systems between agencies don't talk to each other necessarily. And we have to figure that out. And, and why don't they? And why do we make it so hard to share information about certain things that we can solve? Um, what kind of braided funding can we use? What kind of um, space? We have a lot of different districts. The public health districts are different than the defects districts, are different than the judicial circuits, are different than the school districts. And we have multiple overlapping things that the same families have to navigate. How do we simplify those things? Um, I, I think um, when I look at, at solutions, it's usually asking the 
like who who said uh, I think Senator Ana Vitarte said the customer like asking the customer or maybe it was the superintendent what you need like the, and the customer is always right. <laughs> I mean, if I were selling you know gourmet food, the customer would always be right. So when you're asking somebody about how to help them survive their day, give them the benefit of the doubt and and say what would make this what what would help you show up at work you know what would help you what would so you, you know, you're closed, you're embarrassed to come to school. Why? What, what is it? And sometimes it's like, I don't have shoes or I don't have, you know, my pencil pack or I don't have this or that. And we forget about that whole intimate personal barrier. Um, nobody wants to not succeed, right? So. Yeah, I almost, cause I work with life coaches on our team every day. I, I kind of feel like if we could put a life coach in every school to work with the school counselors and mental health experts, like, cause I think, what you're saying, Polly, just, you know, from, you know, a, a social perspective, you know, all, all of these barriers are kind of the, the root cause of, of everything we're talking about. And so I, I think if, you know, again, we think, think differently about, you know, school districts, I'll, I'll use the word districts, you know, that are willing to, I think, you know, put innovative approaches forward. I mean, we, we should be rewarding them, I think, in some ways. I, I don't believe, I mean, just, you know, one size fits all for all, you know, 180 school districts in Georgia. But I think if, if we have school districts that are willing to, you know, where it's accessible, like one of my counties are lucky that they can contract with Tanner Health System and actually have true mental health, behavioral health experts in the, the school, um, you know, how are we rewarding them to do more of that? And then the ones who don't, then, you know, it is, it's, it's kind of their choice, but then, you know, how do you break down that barrier where, you know, Tanner doesn't exist in a community, but we can maybe set up some sort of telehealth or some other sort of system to connect that school. So they have that, that, that asset. And that's a debate I know I've had with a lot of superintendents and educators around, um, you know, what, what's the, what's the future, I won't say use, but what, what's the future role of school counselors in this day and age? And, 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 and I think there's a place for them, but I think, how do we also build in this mental health aspect? I mean, even for special needs students and a lot of the, the, the dynamics we've seen with population growth in some counties uh, for autistic children and others, I mean, how, how does all this kind of fit together to make sure that we are meeting the customer's need and we're not pushing them out to have to go find another school district or, or in many cases, go hire an attorney to fight their own school district to get the resources and, and things that they as a family may need. And I've seen that in my own, my own school district when I was on the school board. So, um, so, I, so I think a lot of those, we, we, we need to make it a little bit, e I think a little bit easier for families and, and, and teachers and, and how we get there. I, th I think there's a way to do it um, but I think it's going to take public and private sector involvement, but I think it's going to take transformational leaders willing to step up to the plate and just push it through. Um, Mike or Steven? I, I could sign everything everyone else has said. I mean, to Senator Ann Vitarte's point, I mean, this is one of the amazing things about public education in the United States is that like, and we give a lot of flexibility in Georgia to individual districts on how they spend money. And so like what this looks like across the state could look so completely different. Uh, I think so much about how we could benefit from just making sure this information is shared in a way that benefits more. I mean, when I was doing research on uh, a poverty weight and how school districts could use this, I, I went to uh, five, maybe seven districts and schools across the state and just ask them, hey, if you were given additional money specifically for kids living in poverty, how would you spend it? And heard five to seven different answers. I went to Baldwin County and they said that uh, they're using their school buses as public transportation for the rest of the community because they recognize that like a lot of the parents of their kids just don't have a way to get from A to B if you don't have a car. Um, Mountain Education Charter System, they're doing the clothes for their students to Polly's point because they realized the amount of shame that these kids are having and not coming to school because their clothes are dirty. And so they just said, hey, listen, every Saturday you bring your clothes, you bring them up Saturday, you pick them up Sunday morning and they're all done for you. Um, went to Tolliver County and Superintendent Fort was saying how he would just take his kids to the zoo. <laughs> like to Superintendent Looney's point, he, he's dealing with kids who haven't been to Atlanta or a major city and nothing, not that it's better to be in a city or anything. It's just that like, to be able to have that 
foundational knowledge to know what you're reading about, so important. Um, but our ability to uh, continue to uh, create innovative spaces for these schools and make sure they have the resources to meet these needs, I think is so huge. And making sure that we can share information between districts for when you are doing a good thing, um, that it's there. And just to a quick aside to Representative Evans' question, uh, equalization grant is a way to make sure that all school districts get the same amount of money. That's that's so, so the state of Georgia doesn't get sued um, <laughs> because that's how like a lot of times funding formulas get thrown out the window as if if there's huge differences between district poverty weight would really be putting your thumb on the scale specifically for those districts with a uh, high number of students living in poverty. It, it would uh, it would flow a lot more like Title I. Um, and so that's what moves it. Georgia has one of the most progressive funding systems in the nation. This would make us kind of, this would show the rest of the country what it looks like for us to really go all in on our students living with poverty because we have the, the third highest number of students uh, living in poverty in the nation. And so that's kind of, that's the difference between those two things. But uh, hey, Steve, I'll, I'll give a quick example to that too. So Paulding County, just quick data numbers, 12th largest school district in the state, 31,000 kids. We rank around, out of 180 school districts, we rank being the 12th largest, almost 150 in wealth. So we always annually rank between number two under Gwinnett County, between two and number four and, and being a recipient of weak equalization funding. And, that, and that's a 200,000 you know, citizen population county in Metro Atlanta receiving that much equalization funding. I mean, that's, that, that's the, the constant challenge and it's crazy. Absolutely. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a quick metrics question. Um, but I mean, multiples of you have touched on braided fundings and how, you know, all these things come from various different departments around the state and from different departments at a federal level, kind of um, what and, and also we wanna make sure that uh, districts have the flexibility to do what they need to do. So what are kind of the high level metrics we should be measuring across anyone that touches child welfare in the state of Georgia? So that way we're, we're all meeting the same things that we need to be make, meeting and we're just looking at high level metrics across the board. So that way everybody's rowing in the same direction. So I'll throw out one, I mean, I don't know how you want to do this, but I mean, I, I'm going to use Polly's term. She corrected me on learning loss, so academic acceleration. And the only reason I'm going to say this is because my first meeting as a, uh, as a vice chair of the Senate Education, Education Committee, we had a discussion, um, the state superintendent was there. Basic question is, how are you collecting data of these students across the state Every school district has different data collection mechanisms. And at some place, we need to have one set of data that we can measure all 180 school districts to really kind of see where is everyone at, who needs help, and are, and are, and are we kind of not just making up ground since you know, March of 2020, but how are we kind of accelerating in areas we're not? And my concern is, as a legislator going forward, is if we don't have good data on this, then I think we're gonna see some school districts across the state, I think, continue to um, have challenges. I don't know, I'll just throw that one as one out there. I, I stumped the going. panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, hold on, Mike's answering on mute. Well, just to be honest, I'm a little bit conflicted. Um, you know, we all have this desire and need to measure everything and I think, I think we forget the humanistic side of the work. Um, I, you know, I didn't jump in a while ago, but I actually was a homeless child. Um, so I, I think I have a unique perspective about what those students feel and, and need. Um, and my perspective, you know, I think varies, varies greatly from what the perception might be about what students like that need. Um, but having said that, um, you know, we have to get out of the business of thinking that every student's gonna be in the same place at the same time. It's just an impossibility. Um, I had a, I had a, I'm gonna tell you a real quick story. I had a, a couple of weeks ago, right before school let out, I had a third grader that was in a, a virtual learning class with his teacher in class. Teacher noticed something was not right. She asked him, is, is everything okay? And he just nodded his head and shook his head no. Well, so the teacher was extremely astute and, and did the right thing. She called for help. Turned out the dad had just committed suicide in front of her 
this third grade boy. Um, mom and dad had gotten into a conflict and he was still sitting in class, still trying to stay focused and do his work. And it's not because he was going to take a test. It's not because he wanted to pass third grade. You know why he was there? Because he loved his teacher. His teacher had a relationship with him and the teacher was a safe person. And so I, I just, I think we got to get out of the bean counting business. We got to get out of the human transformation business and take kids where they are and recognize that this is a journey and we're all going to arrive at different places in different times. Uh, and I don't know how we get that because you have to have accountability, uh, but you also, you know, have to be human. So I think the solution is one of progress or the, the data. What's important is making progress and not about being at the same place at the same time. I, I love that, Mike. I couldn't agree more. I, I also think that the um, definition of progress is an important thing to think about um, and sort of parent engagement. I mean, if I had a a penny for every time somebody said that they were working on parent engagement and really what it meant is that the parents could show up for every meeting they could make the you know buy make cupcakes for the class on the drop of a dime you know all of that i'd have like probably ten dollars um and so i think that we need to think about what that what parent engagement and what um like you said the human part looks like and what do we call progress right is it progress for somebody to not who doesn't who doesn't at that point in their life, they don't want to go to medical school, you know, in junior and high school, they don't think they ever want to go to medical school. They don't even know if they want to go to college, but there's a lot of pressure from the school counselors and from all these people to make good grades on your SAT and your ACT. And what is that actually measuring? Is it culturally or developmentally appropriate what it's measuring? Is it effective? Is it going to make them better medical students or whatever? I don't know. And is, how much of it is industry and how much of it is, is necessary? And I think that we, for, for a long time, I mean, I mean, I know my generation, and I'm probably the oldest one here, um, there was an assumption that if you made, if you scored a perfect on your SAT, then you were better prepared for success. And, and while we may pay people who score higher on their SATs more, I'm not sure that my measurement of success is the same as that, um, because success is you know, when a human being is thriving and it's not always monetary and it's not always with a degree, a certain degree or a certain volume of school. Um, and so I think that, that thinking about what success really looks like for people, I mean, look at the success of our tech colleges. I mean, they have like a 95% job placement rate and they retrain a million folks, you know, who, who have had other different jobs that have gone away, regardless of the degrees that they've had or their life choices or their life's predicaments. So I think that thinking about it that way is important. And, and that's why the measuring thing is really a tricky, not tricky animal, you know, I think that's why we were stumped. <laughs> Amy. Well, the poly to your point on that last one, because we didn't really touch on it. But that whole intersection between K-12 and the technical colleges, like these career academies, I mean, I, I ask, have started asking the question, what, what is really the, the utility of career academies in their current form going forward? If students don't have access to transportation to get to a career academy in their local communities. And so, so in mo so many cases, like as we look forward, instead of you know, just saying, hey, here's $3 million, go build yourself a building. How are we taking the career academies and integrating it, I mean, into our high schools where the students already are? And I think we'll see greater enrollment. I think we'll see, you know, um, you know, greater, you know, graduation from those academies. And if, if I'm, you know, my, you know, being a superintendent and instead of maybe $3 million for capital, you give me $3 million for program. If he's able to integrate it into a high school, I'm, he, I, I'm not going to speak for you, sir, but you, you may find better use for that money, um, you know, and how, and how you push more kids in and out the door of those programs to be successful. So um, I just think we got to think about it differently, but, but what you both said is right on the money. I think you hacked into my computer and stole my cliff notes. <laughs> um. I think, okay, well, it's 2.35 and I really wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so I think we've hit on some really good things here about you know, making sure that we're looking at what kids need to be successful and how we're, we're meeting them where they're at in terms of either their educational attainment or their, like, their home situation or where they need to be or you know, what good is the program if a kid can't get to it as or if, what good is a training program if the parent can't get to it either or 
you know, oh, great, you offered all this online, but nobody has the broadband to tap into it, right? Like there's, it's a whole ecosystem. And I think we really, y'all did a great job of pointing out that it's not just um, infrastructure. It's, it's the whole, the whole ball of wax. Um, I'd really like to thank our panelists. Uh, I will give each of you two sentences to be like, what is the parting thought that you want to leave with the universe? Um, because that's what we're going to do today. And I wanted to put a lot of pressure on you. So who has, and I'm going to start, I'm, um, we're going to start with, uh, Mike, cause he's, he's the winner in my order on my screen, but he's on mute. The little first grade boy was in a science class that had a guest speaker with a farmer. Mm -hmm. The farmer was telling him about this big truck he had full of poo. And the boy said, what are you going to do with that poo, Mr. Farmer? He says, I'm going to spread it all over my, my strawberries. And he says, sir, I don't know where your farm is, but where I come from, you put sugar and whipped cream on strawberries. <laughs> Perfect. That is exactly what we needed. Uh, Steven. Yeah, I'll just reiterate a point that uh, Superintendent Looney made before the strawberry joke, um, which is uh, like, we're gonna, we're gonna be judged, our, our accountability systems, the way the state rankings, kind of all those ways that we measure the quality of the state of public education in Georgia, um, really does fall down the lines of how do we treat our, our most disadvantaged students. And we know that the pandemic hit those kids and their families the hardest. And so my parting thought is just how do we address students experiencing homelessness? How do we exhibit, how do we support communities where the pandemic has ravaged neighborhoods and churches and businesses, uh, students with disabilities, English language learners, these folks that might have struggled during distance learning. That, that will be the measure of our system moving forward. And I hope we can uh, meet the challenge. All right, Polly. I, 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 can't top either the strawberry story or Stephen's comment, but my- Well, the ground is fertile for you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll start, start trying to grow something right now. Um, I would, I, the seed I would plant is why. Like if something's not working for a family or a kid or a teacher or a principal or a superintendent or a senator, I mean, always ask why. You know, we have a thing with uh, in um, child, child policy world uh, is that a lot of times we're accusatory and assumptive and we say things like, you know, what happened, you know, you ask a kid, why did you do that? Or what, what happened? Like, don't do that. You don't, you know, better, like, don't think that way. Try to think about what the root cause is. Why, why didn't it work? Why did it work? And that to me is how we should be thinking about absolutely everything that comes before us. Um, and, not assume like we have a lot of assumptions we have a lot of very old old assumptions from way back um, made by people who have uh taught other people to make the same assumptions and i think that we need to sometimes just put those assumptions aside and just start start from ground zero and say why like what what is what can and how can how can we be helpful to you so that's all i got all right so i, I don't know how i follow any of that <laughs> Um, but I, but I, I mean, the only thing just, and I'll, and I'm just going to use current events is that I think if we're going to fix the workforce problem we have right now. That's just killing our economy. And it's in, in many ways of businesses struggling. I mean, our economy is good, but I think we're seeing signs that the workforce challenges were, you know, and all that mess. Um, we, we need to, we need to leverage, I think our education system and our technical colleges um, to kind of move us in a direction to do something bold to, to get us out of this crisis. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to change. And I think the first place you start, you can reach the most families and the most workers and, 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 and have a real conversation is, I think, in our schools um, about, you know, what is, to Polly's point, what is not just the root cause. I mean, I think it's unemployment. There's a variety of issues, but I think let's 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 make our technical college system, I think, prominent again. Um, make the investments that you know will also impact our superintendent and K twelve system across the state. Um, if we're going to get out of this crisis, so. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, 
I swear that y'all were not plants. So the next panel is actually on technical and community college. So thank you for setting that up. Like that was just a softball that I can just hit out of the park on that one. Um, this has been amazing. I would like to thank our panelists so much for taking the time to, to be here and to answer these questions and to give their perspectives. And I hope to see everybody in two weeks at technical and community colleges, which were totally set up so well by you all. And then our final panel is on infrastructure and capacity building, which was also multiple mentions here. So thank you everyone for being such great panelists and thank you for being a great audience and we'll see you next time.